So Scott kind of laid out networks. Neuronext is both very similar to StrokeNet the way Scott described and very different uh, in, in many different ways. So I, I'm going to give you the quick and dirty um, summary of, of Neuronext. So Neuronext was, was designed, they were really in the original RFA, there were three objectives uh, that were laid out to test promising new therapies, uh, to increase the efficiency of clinical trials, and to respond quickly as new opportunities arise to test promising treatments for people with neurological disease. Um, you know, we, we've um, had meetings with NIEDS as the network has expanded, and you know, without getting too much into the, into the metrics here, because it's just not time, I think Neuronex has done a good job of the first two. Uh, we've been able to, to definitely increase efficiency uh, there's lots of, of, of areas similar to the ways that, that StrokeNet is using with the master trial agreements and the central IRB. You've got a common data system, which you know, the common data elements, the idea behind that is that you collect the same things across study. A network helps that because then, especially like something like NeuralNex where it's different diseases, we're using a lot of the common things for demographics, for AEs that are similar. So even across diseases, there's some consistency in order to, to compare that, which is the same with StrokeNet and the Stroke Studies will have the same basic data structure. The thing that we're struggling with, and I'll get into this as I explain how things come in, is the, the, the responding quickly. And part of that is, is uh, I mean, one of the, the blessings and challenges of Neuronex is there's been a lot of interest. And so one of the, the challenges, even with the network, where, you know, it, it, as Scott mentioned, the network doesn't control what comes into the network, other than there's a feasibility review uh, if things are feasible. But for something like Neuronex, which covers all kind of diseases now really outside of stroke and, and, and potentially a few others. It's a very wide net that you're casting. And so there are lots of ideas that, that come in. Uh, even within a network, there's limited resources. So one of the concerns that we've talked with in IADS about how to manage this is you don't want to get you know, studies that are good but not really earth-shattering that suck up all the resources, that something really promising comes down the pipeline that you would like to put in the network and all of a sudden you know, you kind of saturated uh, the network and it's a fine balance between that because you can't wait around for the next great thing and do nothing with the network. So that that's um, so it's the third that we're still struggling a little bit with in terms of how to respond quickly. Which also you know it, it, the, the respond quickly is also a challenge when the grant has to be written and go through you know study section in order to get funding to do one. Because if you if those of you know who've written a grant, that's not something where you write the grant and you get your feedback the next day. Although there are some ways in neural next with the industry mechanism. I assume the stroke that has this as well, where uh, the review can be much more quicker, uh, where it's different from like the UO1 or the other. So just to talk about the infrastructure for Neuronex, which is really you know, basically very similar to what you just heard from StrokeNet. So uh, it's a it's a UL one, so it's a collaborative mechanism. So NIDS is, is heavily involved. Uh, Janice Cordell and Elizabeth McNeil uh, are currently uh, are individuals who are very involved. Janice is the administrative person. Elizabeth is the, the scientific program manager. So Elizabeth participates in our executive committee uh, calls and is very active in the network. There's a clinical coordination that Mary directs at Mass General, then the data coordinating center is here in Iowa. And then you, know, you have to have the map. So here's the, the distribution of sites. Again, it was selected similarly the way that, that it was stroke meant to try to have geographic distribution uh, across the U.S. So there, there are 20, if you asked the million dollar question, you know, we're going to have Jeopardy later, if you ask this question, no one could ever get it right. How many sites are in Neuronex? And that's an impossible question to answer that I still don't think we know the answer to because it depends on what context you mean. There are 25 administrative sites and there are 25 grants. Some of those, though, consider themselves partners, like there's a SUNY consortium of which there are four SUNYs, and then each of those have different hospitals. And, then, and some of them, the master clinical trial agreement at the parent covers the, the spoke, and some of them have to have separate master clinical trial agreements. So it really depends on what question you're talking about. An individual study, this might be a separate site because they have a separate master clinical trial agreement. If we're talking about metrics at the site level, if you've ramped it up. So it's one of those questions that I don't know if we'll ever have an answer to if somebody says how many sites are in Neuronex. But there are 25, there are 25 grants that have gone out. And then there are other spokes then within each of those. Some of those are are adults. Some of them are, are combinations between pediatric and adult sites. So um, Cincinnati Children's Children's Hospital DC. So there are some pediatric sites. And one of the the goals in the RFA, although not a requirement, is to try to with neural network infrastructure to help do pediatric clinical trials and trials in rare you know rare neurological disorders. 
So why apply to use Neuronext? Obviously, for the reasons Scott mentioned, it's access to the Neuronext infrastructure. There's three novel initiatives that, are, that in the stroke has had pulled some of these in as well. The master clinical trial agreements, uh, which have now all been signed to the, the studies as they come into the network. We don't have to do that for every study that comes through. Uh, the central IRB, it's actually, it was an interesting kind of approach going through that. It kind of proved proof of concept you could do this. And really, um, I mean, just having gone through it, and Mary can expand on this more, if we had put the network together independently and said you have to give a central IRB, it would have been much harder, but somehow the fact that it was in the RFA from NINDS that said you have to do this, I mean, we got some pushback originally, but once you said, okay, you agreed to this when you submitted your grant, you have to do this, that kind of pushed people over the edge, and, 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 then, and then they get over their initial fears, and it actually seems to be working really well, and a lot of the, the concerns that came up seem to not really be, um, you know, be that, that big of a deal. Yes, money is a motivator. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> It's amazing how that works. Uh, the other thing, and this kind of this is interesting. And Scott mentioned that, that training, like training fellows, was a component in Strugnet. Training was not really in the in the original RFA for Neuronext, uh, but it's actually become something that I think is one of the biggest advantages we've developed through the network. And that's the the availability of experienced trial design staff. And so one of the things we cover a wide range of, of disorders. So that's really anything in the neurosciences that could come in. There are a lot of junior investigators, just like you guys, that have an idea with a clinical trial that don't have access to a statistician, don't have access to the infrastructure to try to pull that off. And if you, I mean, think of, put yourself in your situation. Many of you, your idea that you would have here, if you had to assemble all of the infrastructure to do that, that's a pretty big challenge at the point where you are in your career. Neuronext was, was intended to try to help that. So you come in, you have access with the infrastructure, and I'll, I'll go through a minute how the whole process flows, but you're partnered with a clinical lead from the CCC and a design lead from the DCC who work with you to kind of clarify. It's actually very similar to what we've been doing in small groups, right? Making sure there's a question. What's the question? What's the primary hypothesis? What you really originally proposed as an underpowered phase three study, what do you really want to do here? How, how can we address that? And so actually that, that training component has, has become actually a pretty, I, I think, um, big strength of, of the network and that we've really been able to, you know, even for things that may not have gotten funded, the investigators have hopefully, I mean, we'd have to ask them to clarify, learn something along the way about study design, how do you frame a question, how do you put this. A lot of the things that also come up in those conversations are the things uh, that, that Dixie and Marianne will talk with you today, or that Dixie mentioned in her talk, the operational thing. Right, the things that, that you guys are now thinking of. Okay, do I need to talk to the company? How am I going to get drug? Right, do I have a commitment to get drug for the study? You might have a great idea, you might have a great design, and then you realize, hey, I have no way to get drug for the study. Everything's going to fall apart. So it's the operational things that people don't think about. So that's another kind of strength of, of the network. A couple of misconceptions that, that we hear from time to time. So we try to, to just mention these to that you don't have to be from a net neural neck site to apply. So it's like stroke, anyone can apply, so whether you're at an institution that's part of Neuronext or an institution that's not, uh, you could come through. So for instance, one of the things that, that is highly possible, the protocols that you guys flesh out here in the course, you know, if you get it fleshed out to a point, you could submit it. You could talk to Elizabeth McNeil at NINDS if it seems appropriate for Neuronext, it's something that could come in as a proposal, because most of what you're studying falls under the purview of Neuronext. Um, the, the, the research disease priorities, this is what Scott mentioned with StrokeNet, it's not a network base, so it doesn't come into the network, decide we're going to do this, we're going to do that. It comes through and we do a determination of is it feasible. And also, we, we now put in feasibility and enthusiasm to try to address that problem about doing, um, uh, turning things around rapidly that are more promising. So we look for feasibility when a proposal comes in, which is, are there patients at the sites? Because obviously, if the neural neck sites don't have access to the patients, it's not going to be doable. That's actually pretty rarely the case. I mean, it would have to be you know, a disorder, or you're really slicing and dicing the population with the criteria so, so finitely. What comes up more often, and the one thing that, that does become an issue for feasibility, is there some special device or piece of equipment that's required for the study that perhaps the, the sites just don't have access to, or it's going to cost too much, so it's not kind of standard of care that the sites may have. That, that has come up where we've had to say things are not feasible just because the equipment uh, that would be required for the, for the um, study is not at the sites. The other thing is enthusiasm. So we do often in this process send out you know, to the sites and say you're experts in this disease at the area. You know, if this study were positive, it's kind of the, the reverse of the thought experiment that Bill Barson mentioned. It's like if this study is positive, would this move the field forward? How much 
of interest would this be to investigators in the field? And what we're really looking for are things that would be on the high end of that, right? If it's something that it's a good design, it's a good question, but if it were positive, people would look and say, eh, it doesn't really tell us anything we don't already know, but that's really not what we're wanting to push through the network you know, with, with the, the priority. So that's kind of the process as things come in, in terms of how that's evaluated. And this is, so this is Elizabeth's email, Elizabeth McNeil, who was the first contact. So if you have an idea, you should talk with Elizabeth first. It will have kind of the internal discussions that, that ties in with the NINDS indecision of does this fit within their kind of structure, do they want to accept it? If it comes through, then it goes through the process I just mentioned, the feasibility review with the Neuronext Executive Committee, uh, which consists of, so myself and Merit is the DCC and CCCPI. It also consists of three site PIs. They rotate, they have a, a two-year term, so they, they serve a two-year term, rotate off so that different site PIs have an opportunity uh, to serve. And then every PI of a neural neck study sits on the executive committee during the life of their grant. So right now, we have nine members on the executive committee, two of us, three network PIs, and then we have four studies that are funded in neural necks. As the number of studies increase or decreases, the numbers of individuals on the executive committee may change. But that's so if you had a grant, you had an idea, you come in, it's it's selected for neural next, one of the ways that you give back to that is serving on the executive committee. And then so the executive committee kind of addresses the overall issues within the network or it's with the network committees, but also does this evaluation of, of priorities for the network. So it's actually um, it, it's it's not a it's not a trivial task, but it's a pretty rewarding task. And I think a lot of the our, the, the two junior PIs that we have I've actually, I think, gotten a lot out of the, just the discussions from the executive committee. So this kind of shows, um, I mean, there's been a lot of interest. So Neuronex started in the fall of 2011. So we're not, we're, we're not three years old yet. We'll have our three-year birthday um, you know, this fall. And there's been 130 proposals, over 130 received today. So there's been a lot of things that have come through. If you look here, the most frequent was stroke, and that, that was in the early years before stroke net. That's not going to be pulled out, so we don't get stroke applications anymore. We do have one stroke study when I show you the studies that we have. That's because that was something that was in the pipeline before stroke net came along. It had kind of gone so far through neural nets that there was a decision to leave it in neural nets. But now, the, the way that I understand it is because the stroke <coughs> study comes through, it's going to go to stroke net. Uh, it would not come to neural nets. So that, will be the most frequently until we get far enough along and the others surpass it because we're not going to see those numbers go up anymore. But we also had a lot of Parkinson's, epilepsy, autism, and you can see just from looking at this list, I mean, it's kind of the same distribution that Scott showed for the, the, the trials that NAND has had. So this covers a wide range of, of, of different diseases, different disorders in the neuroscience. We've also, so of those, you know, some of those have been weeded out in the feasibility process. You know, some have not gone forward for, for other reasons. Because there's, there's two reviews. There's a, a, the Network Executive Committee review. And then there's an NINDS Extramural Science Council review. And so you have to pass both of those then to go forward for the grant application. We've had 25 grant applications, um, 14. So that there are three mechanisms for Neuronex, the same structure that Scott mentioned for stroke math. There's a UL1, which is the academic investigator initiated study. The U44 is an SBIR mechanism. We've had two of those. And then X01 is an industry partnership. So with an X01 is where there's a collaboration with a company who contributes to part of the cost of the study. So it's a cost share. It's negotiated between NIEDS and the company where there's some percentage of funds that the company may kick in uh, and then the rest might be covered by, by a grant. That is kind of a mechanism that, that with something like Neuronex, it, it, it just what we've discovered, and we're trying to do more outreach, and as the first study, I think, gets implemented and done, it, you know, it's kind of like no one wants to be first. Uh, but it's also, it's a mechanism that may not be attractive to a large drug company that has like, infrastructure, but we think, and, and some of the feedback we've got for a small biotech, it's something that might be attractive. A small biotech might need to do a study to push some mechanism along, but it's very, it's a, kind of the same thing with you. It might be a company that's got four or five employees, it's very difficult to assemble all the infrastructure to do that, but if they can tap into a network, they don't have to put everything together. They can use the network resources. So that's been kind of the outreach that we've been doing, trying to kind of sell that feature of the network to companies who might have, um, who might want to use that, that infrastructure. These are the four studies. So here's a picture of, the, of three of the four PIs. So this was taken at AVN. This was actually maybe before 104 was funded or it had just been funded. So the three, Trials are in three different disorders. So in, in so in, in 
one and whatever is the way we decided to do studies. And they, some of them have their cute little acronym. So NN 101 is a spinal muscular atrophy biomarker study. That's the super baby study that you heard about yesterday. That's the one where the baby's got onesies. And so Dr. Cole, who is on the left, is the one who actually wore the cake at the <laughs> SMA. I mean, it was a great photo. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's a study that, that's actually, it's close to the end of enrollment. Um, there's two years of follow-up, so we should have that finished enrollment and results for that soon. Uh, NN102 is an intervention study for a drug for multiple sclerosis. That one um, started recruitment in the spring, is that right? In the spring, we're, we're about halfway through recruitment, so that one is actually slightly um, ahead of schedule, which uh, being slightly ahead of schedule for a lot of neuroscience clinical trials means that you're way ahead of schedule based on most of the experience. Um, and then 103 is a slightly different uh, issue where that started and we're struggling with recruitment there. There's actually uh, some discussion to do that, but that one is, is underway. That's a myasthenia gravis study. Uh, again, a drug intervention study. And then the last study, the one that will be uh, launched this fall, is the stroke study that I mentioned. So this is an acute stroke intervention trial that is doing a dose finding. So this is more of a CRM type approach that we mentioned for the early phase. And that one is of interest and for us as a network because that's our first industry partnership. <coughs> we have a partner with, uh, with an academic investigator who worked with a company who came to us. So it's kind of uh, something that's high on our radar because we really want to show that the network can work with you know, an industry partnership and make a study work. So just to kind of summarize, uh, you know, as I mentioned, Neuralnex not quite three years old. Three years old. There's been a high level of, of interest. It's kind of um, to use an Iowa saying: if you build it, they will come. Right. So we built the baseball field in the cornfield, and investigators have come out of the corn with their with their proposals. <laughs> and we we've gotten several several you know funded. So and we the ones that we funded, the startup has the, so the efficiencies that we hope to achieve for startup. We've actually seen that. So I mean, there's been. A few hiccups, uh, hiccups, hiccups along the way, but the CRRB has been a much more efficient process than going through you know, each individual site. Uh, IRB, the master clinical trial agreements in particular, have been a huge you know, savings in terms of the efficiency. I mean, the other thing is kind of what Scott alluded to. So there's a cost to keeping the network going, but that cost enables us as a network to develop infrastructure which helps you know, kind of strengthen the network as a whole, both the studies that are being run in the network and the studies that are coming through. So I mentioned kind of the, the training activities, right? A lot of the, the development work that's done with investigators who come in with proposals, that would not be possible in the same level in the same structured environment without kind of the infrastructure of the network. There are other aspects of that. So we're able to kind of share what we know across studies from the network perspective. And that, that's kind of thing, even with groups doing the same studies, and a lot of the traditional model, there might not be a lot of communication across studies. So, you know, we might have two studies here at Iowa funded through NINDS, but the teams are kind of in their own little silo and there's not a lot of communication. With the network infrastructure, we're both, you know, the teams will have team meetings, but we have network meetings where we're kind of looking at it as a whole. Okay, in this study, you have this problem. How did you address that? What can we learn from that and take over to this study? So even, you know, even where it seems like it's the same people, just the network structure somehow helps to, helps to facilitate that. As well as, you know, across, you know, CCC and DCC, every clinical trial where there's a clinical coordinating center and a data coordinating center, you know, there's, there's a partnership that you're building. The fact that now we've been working with MGH for three years on the network, we know each other, we know each other's styles, and we have kind of a working relationship that, that we kind of work, works really well together. And as we transition with different studies, we kind of know, you know what our styles are. We kind of develop, in some ways, almost a joint style. It's probably would be tough for us to work with, with other people in some, in some studies like this now because we get so, so familiar with each other. But that's also kind of a, kind of a strength is that we've developed this kind of joint relationship. And we, we had dinner last night. One of the things we've talked about, and we're, we're, we're slowly moving towards that, and I think we're, we're actually pretty close, is the way we think of ourselves, like with Neuronext, and we want to get to that where investigators see us not as this person is at the data coordinating center or this person is at the clinical coordinating center, that this person is with the Neuronext coordinating center. And like the lines between the two are kind of blurred, that they see us as, as a team where it's not clear that we're one versus the other, but we're the Neuronext team who are there to help the investigators. That's the 25,000 foot overview of Neuronext. Glad to take questions.